or we should be. I think we are live with the Atlas Project. Hi, everyone. I'm Ben Baer. I'm a fellow at the Ayn Rand Institute. With me is Greg Salmieri. We're together live in New York tonight. I'm usually uh, home in New Orleans, but uh, visiting this week. And so we thought we would do the broadcast together live, especially since this is the uh, end of the first part of the book, the first third of the book, part one, non-contradiction. And we're going to do the usual thing that we do tonight by talking about the latest chapter of reading, uh, chapter 10, which is Wyatt's Torch. But we're going to go a little longer than usual. We usually go about an hour and a half. Tonight we're going to go about two hours and spend the extra half hour reflecting on this first third of the book and what the overall arc of the plot has been and any uh, significance that we want to attach to that. And you should feel free, especially then, to ask us questions about what your thoughts are on kind of the book as a whole up to this point. And again, we want to continue to encourage first-time readers to identify themselves in the chat section uh, with the initials FTR in all caps to let us know if you want to say something. But uh, I think that's all I have to say for now. So Greg, you want to get started by giving us an overview of the plot of at least this last chapter? Yeah, I just want to review just some a couple of key events that we have some orientation for what we're looking at. So the, the chapter begins with Dagny and Reardon uh, still in Wisconsin where they were on their vacation and they had discovered uh, a motor that s seems to have once worked and uh, run on static electricity, converting atmospheric static electricity to dynamic power. And they're in a quest now to discover the inventor of the motor and they're going around in uh, Wisconsin doing some research. Dagny gets in touch with Eddie uh, about this, who is in a panic. He wants her to come back uh, right away to deal with, uh, well, he can't quite explain what it is, but it looks like they're trying to kill Colorado. So there are some plans afoot to, uh, for new laws or new measures. We'll see exactly what they are as we go forward that would looks like they're designed to target the industrial sector of the country in Colorado. And recall the significance of that is throughout the whole story, Colorado has been the one dynamic, growing, prosperous area of the country. The whole rest of the country is in decline. And we've just successfully completed the building of the John Galt Line, which was the railroad branch now of Taggart Transcontinental, it's the Rio Norte Line, that's going to serve this prosperous area in Colorado. Uh, it was important to build this branch because it was going to save Tagger Transcontinental, the company Dagny works for and is uh, a major stockholder in her family company. But also, if this line hadn't been built, there was the worry that, um, or Dagny was convinced, that the industrial boom in Colorado would end. These businesses would be destroyed for lack of decent transportation. And she thinks that if that happens, the whole country's economy will be destroyed. There'll be just no future for the country, and it will go into... Uh, into a post-industrial kind of poverty, as we are getting the sense has happened to a lot of areas around the world. And we've now seen in Chapter 9 has happened to parts of America, indeed parts of Wisconsin, where they were just traveling. So the, um, the stakes are very high. Eddie wants her to come back and try to fight this. And so she and Reardon do come back, uh, go back to work. And throughout the rest of the chapter, there are two uh, continuing threads that we're going to talk about. One is Dagny's continued attempts to find the inventor of the motor, and we're going to keep progress with that, and we'll see that this continues on into the, the next book of the novel, the next part of the novel. And the other is the question of what's going to happen with these laws. Will they be able to be prevented? Why are they happening? And and so forth, and we'll take a look at what happens there. We'll see that eventually they do get passed, of course. <coughs> and then uh, during the course of this, we get some uh, insight into Reardon's development. We've had questions about Reardon's relationship with Lillian, and of course now with Daphne, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, so Ben, do you want to start us off with the business of the chapter? Well, the main business being the uh, pursuit of the motor, right? Uh, yeah. And uh, Boy, as- we just going to first, anyway. As, as Greg alluded to, this is the, the chapter opens with uh, Dagny and Reardon still in Wisconsin, 
And uh, I'm going to focus first here on the leads that Dagny tries to follow to identify the inventor of this motor. Uh, we, she, does an inter she does interviews with a whole range of characters from the top, of the bottom, top to the bottom of the society, a whole different range of personality and character types. Uh, and we posted an online discussion question about this earlier, asking what similarities and differences there are among the people that Dagny interviews in her quest to find the motor. And we got some, I think, pretty interesting responses uh, from a number of different people on the Facebook group online, uh, identifying a range of similarities and uh, a, a few differences, mostly similarities. Uh, and I want to focus on starting with kind of narrower ranges of similarities and then seeing how much broader we can go. Uh, Judy, in the online discussion, said that uh, there were, with the exception of the wife of William Hastings, who's one of the last people that Dagny interviews, most of the characters in the book, sorry, uh, most of the characters that Dagny interviews say things like, nothing is their fault, nothing was given to them, life wasn't fair to them. Uh, when I read this, I thought that Judy was right on about at least a couple of the characters that Dagny interviews, but with, uh, especially with regard to Lawson and Hunsacker. Uh, though I think it's interesting that you don't quite get that coming uh, from all of the people, even not even all of the ones that, that uh, are portrayed in a kind of negative light. So for example, Mayor Bascom and Ivy Starnes don't talk about uh, uh, nothing being their fault or nothing ever being given to them, or at least they don't stress it as much. Uh, and yet they're still painted in a negative way. Now, maybe that's just because they're not uh, uh, in as bad straits as the other characters, and so they haven't gotten to that point yet. Uh, they've not yet gone under. But I do think that there are uh, broader similarities you can see between uh, also uh, not only Loss and Hunsacker, but also Starnes and the mayor. Um, Lisa online pointed out that she said that they all... Uh, she, the way she puts it is that they believe in socialistic views. Now that's true about Hunsacker, Lawson, and Starnes. Not quite the mayor, though Lisa points out that the mayor has a kind of materialist viewpoint, which is uh, important because people forget that, uh, that Marxists are kind of materialist. The, the mayor perhaps doesn't realize that. Uh, Al, did you want to yeah, throw something in there on that? I focused on the mayor's pragmatism. He, okay. he reminded me a lot of the character Babbitt. Sinclair Lewis is Babbitt. Uh, yes, and uh, Robert Mayhew in his discussion of the fountain pointed out that Ayn Rand read a lot of Sinclair Lewis. He did. Play. This is not to take away from ba Baskin's being an, an original character. It's far, it's far more clearly defined, far more uh, a, a articulate than Babbitt ever was. But I think there's certainly well, a similarity. He's also a bit part kind of character, whereas Babbitt's mm -hmm. uh, more like developed in the sense of we get more than one scene of him. Yeah. And he's rather more self-aware than Babbitt. So even though it's a, a bit of a stretch, I think, to say that um, uh, Bascom is similar to someone like Ivy Starnes uh, because he happens to ha share a view with an aspect of another view that she shares, I think there is a broader, an even broader way uh, in which there's something in common between somebody like Mayor Bascom and Ivy Starnes, and I think that's hard to see at first because they do seem so different otherwise. He's this kind of fat cat uh, uh, sitting in his uh, house in Wisconsin uh, talking about, you know, playing with his jewels and so forth, um, but, and she's this kind of mystic who's uh, down in Louisiana and uh, doesn't claim to be interested in the same kinds of things I mean, the mayor he's is. He's a fat cat, we should say. He's a fat cat in a... In a literal and figurative. In a fairly small pond or yeah. fish. Uh, the mayor I mean, of trash. Yeah, is, and he's the, portrayed uh, as a kind of small time. So that's fair. Big wig. That's yeah. fair. Um, he's, yeah, he's more self-aware than a lot of the negative characters in the book. But yeah, or um, we'll think he's more self-aware than a lot of the negative characters. And I, um, he definitely has a certain kind of, he's upfront about what he's doing and what his standards are. Um, he's shrewd without intelligence, his eyes are described as, I think, right? Um, so it's not clear that he's sort of like deeply introspectively self-aware, but he's not um, dissembling about what he's up to. Does that sound? He has no sense of shame. 
I about think it. Yeah, so he doesn't think what he's doing is wrong, so he's nothing to hide. He's very candid about uh, what he's up to and what he thinks other people are up to. And in part that's because he thinks everybody is yeah. that way. Yeah. Uh, this is the way people get ahead, as you ought to know, he says to, to Reardon. But I don't think he thinks there's nothing wrong with it because he looks at them like fellow conspirators. conspirators. And Ben, you were pointing out about how he talks about principles when we were talking the other day. If he didn't think there was anything wrong, I don't know that he'd do that. He says he doesn't care about the Sunday sermons. He doesn't need any principles. Uh, what matters is good, solid material objects, which brings out that kind of emphasis on a kind of crude materialism that we were talking about before. But yeah, that's what you pointed out to me about it was that he seems like he's bringing those things up unbidden. Like if someone was saying to him, "Well, what about the Sunday sermons?" and he was saying, "Ah, I got he's no." He's being use for defensive, them. Yeah. it seems, uh, and he's not the only one who's defensive in this chapter. Uh, among, there's there's a similar kind of defensiveness among a number of the characters that are interviewed, though they're defensive about different things. Um, Maybe we'll get to some of those with the other ones. But uh, I like to compare S Ivy Starnes and the mayor because they seem so different on a certain level. But uh, Anna, who's, who's with us, uh, actually, I thought pointed out a really good similarity between the two. I don't know if you remember the comment that you wrote. Uh, well, I wrote comments in two different places about them. But OK, so he is. You didn't put it so much in terms of a similarity. You said that they took opposite, were on opposite sides of a, of a kind of coin. But she, it's. She's more explicit about the ideas she does hold, but she holds bad ideas. And he puts aside, he doesn't think ideas are important. But they're both, so one of them is taking the, uh, the, the body side of the mind body dichotomy, and the other one's taking the mind or the spirit side of the mind spirit dichotomy. But it's, they're, they're both divorcing them. Right? They're both saying these two things are inseparable, or are, are, are completely separate from each other. Have we named this dichotomy as like a unit people are holding in mind if they're following this? I'm I not, don't think we have officially. I mean, it's come up in a lot of our discussions. We've talked about it in connection with certainly the bum in the diner, right? right. And, and Robert Stadler's idea that the, either the mind in Stadler's case, or in the case of the bum in the diner, the spirit is something very distinct from uh, our emotions, our um, the, the part of us that's concerned also with survival, with food, with sex, the more animal-like uh, parts of our lives. But there's some kind of gulf between them. It comes from religion, right? Because in, in Christianity, you know, the truth comes from the supernatural. And when you're focusing on this world and trying to find truth in this world, you're ignoring the supernatural. So you're being evil in a sense, or, or not being as good as you could. So the mayor is, is saying, yeah, I'm, I'm not virtuous, but at least I'm happy. And I'm looking at this world. And Ivy Starnes is more like, look, I'm, I'm not concerned with this world. I'm looking at the supernatural. So in that sense, they have that point of view. But that's because of religion, right? So it's everywhere in our yeah, culture. Yeah, and it's interesting to see the, the, the there are a few indirect allusions to religion in this chapter. Uh, well, one of them is Bascom saying he doesn't care about the Sunday sermons, but then when it comes to Ivy Starnes, what does she have in her cottage? She's got these uh, a Buddha. Uh, it turned, uh, well, I don't know how pop it is for her. Jean Lawson also has a statue of a Hindu goddess, and Reardon, when he's uh, feeling guilty, who we're, you're going to talk about this scene later, um, it alludes to a, a line from the New Testament. Uh, who am I to cast the first stone, right? So, let's see. I think, I think now is maybe a good time to transition to the next section, but I just want to point out that since we were talking about the mayor, at one point in the, in the conversation right after they get done with him, Dagny suggests that there's a certain uh, aspect of the mayor's comments that Reardon should reflect on. Um, Before we go to, to Reardon, though, so, I mean, it's, you'd made the point earlier about there's a kind of progression to these people when we were talking that, that Daphne speaks, uh, speaks to. And it, it's so, so they're, they're, they talk to a clerk, and he directs them to this mayor, Bascom, who's a kind of corrupt guy but knows he's corrupt and uh, kind of humorous character, really. Um, it's worth from there to Gene Lawson. Well, I was going to talk about this later in the, in the final section on the. How mentality. does he come up with? 
but if you want to well, talk now. Well, because it's part of the people she see. I'm confused. All right. So the, she, there's Jean Lawson, right? There's uh, who was the banker with a heart uh, who lent money for this uh, for this uh, uh, for, for the, the uh, Mark Yance, owner to I have think. it for Mark Jans. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, Lee Hunsacker, who's the next owner. Um, the owner, I, I guess, prior to Jans. Uh, or, prior to, yes. Yeah. So Jans bought it in a bankruptcy sale of the bank of Jean Lawson. We, so we, we trace it back from Hunsacker to Jans. Uh, then from there, we go to Lawson. Lawson uh, loaned the money to this guy, uh, uh, to, to Hunsacker, to run this And then we go to the Starnes. Or, the right. Starnes. And, in the Starnes, and it's just there are points we talked a bit about Hunsacker in the supplemental broadcast we did on Sunday. He's a kind of amusing parody of Marxism, right? He's the guy who uh, expects the means of production to condition his mind, and uh, uh, he, he can't or can't write his autobiography because his typewriter skip isn't spaces. working. It skips spaces, and it's covered in dust, so he's not even trying. Um, and uh, he's one of these people who who was it that said? Um, that they're all there bl shifting the blame types. Um, uh, several people uh, pointed that out yeah. uh, in the discussion group. I think uh, Judy was Judy was, yeah. was one of them, or a and few others. And he's a really particularly anti-free. Like I'm the way people made me, right? And look what they've made of me, and so forth. Um, Lawson, we'll talk about later, I guess. But there's, I mean, the question of what he's after is, I think, an interesting question, and. I'm a bit, I'm not sure how that might come up. We'll, we'll cycle back around to it if we, um, but then that he goes, it it leads from there to the Starnes heirs, the heirs of, of Jed Starn who made the factory, and one of them's a kind of worthless bum, and then ultimately to Ivy Starnes. And w what I felt from our earlier conversation was, uh, we wanted to, to touch on about Ivy is that Dagny has a kind of reaction to her that she doesn't have to the others. And uh, does anyone have any thoughts about that? As an evaluation she makes of her. Yeah. Yeah. Muhammad? Um, <clears throat> she made a comment to the to tune of, uh, this is what evil looks like. Mm -hmm. you know. I remember this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So she thinks of her as like pure naked evil. And yet at the same time, she thinks, ah, it's the same old tripe you've heard everywhere. So um, Dagny is having this reaction to Ivy like she's much worse than the others. It's just some lady sitting on a pillow in the, in the, in the swamp. What's the big deal? And yet she's some, yeah, what was it, in her ill-smelling bungalow yeah. uh, with her, her you know, um, uh, Buddhist chotskis or whatever. On the shores um, of the Mississippi. But, yeah, so at, at once she has this reaction to her like she's much worse, but intellectually she's can't put her finger on much. Uh, it's just like what everybody else says. So that's an interesting thing to notice about Though Daphne's it, perspective on her. The, whatever, however she's reacting, it's, it's causing her to uh, emote in a way that, that mm -hmm. Ivy seems to be noticing because Ivy's like threatened. She, like, yeah. just get away from me. D don't come any closer. She feels now, like she's going to be attacked. Judy points out, and I think we said this, said this before, that Daphne says or, or thinks in her head that Ivy's theory is pure evil, and I think that's right. Um, although it's not clear to me, Judy, if it's her theory, I mean, she would agree that her theory is evil, or if it's her character that she's reacting to so strongly. She says this is pure naked evil, but there's also a line around the same point in the book where she also says in her thoughts, you know, that she's not worse than the others, and there's some question in Daphne's head why she regards... Ivy as worse than the other characters. Yeah. Like, uh, it's interesting in this chapter the way she describes their ethic. Right? It's it's like uh, they 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 sacrificed anything. They didn't do anything for their own interest. And it's almost like the the, the farther they take that point, the more virtuous they are. And that's actually Kant's ethic. And I, I always wonder if that's what she kind of put his ethic here, and she's saying this is the most evil thing ever. Uh, well, I, I don't think that's an accident, probably. Arguably, let's, since Kant's not mentioned in the novel and how to, and how to analyze his theory. If you do anything for your own self-interest, 
it's not virtue. It's well, let virtue. I think the, there's. I think the question of how to interpret Kant. I think that's there's a lot to that about Kant, but that brings a whole other complicated figure into the into the picture. So I think it's better for our purposes to focus on the view that we're finding in the novel and um, we'll uh, tag the point that this might be similar to Kant's view. Um, but yeah, I think we, we see this first coming up, right, in this looking section when she talks to Lawson. And Lawson keeps saying, look, I didn't make a profit, I didn't make a profit, it's okay. And, and Dagny reacts, she, that's the most contemptible, contemptible thing or even despicable thing uh, I think somebody could say. And um, Starnes is maybe similar to that, but what is she, how is she different than Lawson? They, yeah. Well, well, she's different from Lawson in that she's trying to live according to the principles and not get stuff on the side at the same time. Uh, so it's very visible what that's going to end up looking like. But I think also at the same time, right after that one, it's described that Dagny has this blinding white glare of anger. What she pictures in her mind is something very concrete. It's not only this person, this is the this is the dead end of what those ideas look like. It doesn't just affect Ivy Starnes. She's thinking of the uh, the the white road with the weeds cracking through and and it and a man contorted with a hand plow. Like it's the ideas lead to this dead end. It's deforming human beings. So she has the concretization of the ideas. Ivy Starn caused people to live like this. Her ideas call well, people to live like this. So it's very she vivid for her. Somewhat though with Lawson too, because she says, have you seen that part of the country recently? Think, there is. The char woman. I yeah, think. I think there's something else though in addition to this. So Lawson is blaming other people and uh, he's still trying to do the same thing. Ivy Starnes blames human nature. Yeah. Right? This plan should have worked but human beings can't live up to it. Well, human beings can be this more spiritual thing. And it's notable that, that uh, Do uh, Lawson is doing now what Sl Ivy was trying to do earlier when she was running the 20th Century Motor Company. And, and we'll find out a little bit more about that history later in the book, but she does tell us the, the bare bones of it in, mm -hmm. the, in this chapter where you know, we tried to implement this idea mm -hmm. that, that need should trump greed and in that case, she, she was trying to run things mm -hmm. uh, for, in this factory, just the same way that Lawson's trying to now run the whole, com the whole yeah. country. Uh, that didn't work out so well for her, apparently. We'll find out more about that later. Uh, but this is now where she's left as a result of that. Um, and we also get a, a hint in this same connection of what people who are trying to run things in this way are after personally in Lawson. And, and the connection you're drawing between Lawson and Ivy Starnes suggests maybe we should look to learn more about this about Starnes. Because there's one moment where she grasps what Lawson wants. While she's there, uh, Lawson thinks she's really there, or hopes maybe she's really there, to, to argue something Sweet about her, her railroad. Mm -hmm. And at one point, he, a couple of times he hints, well, maybe are you sure you don't? And eventually he says, well, you know, I can't promise anything. When she keeps trying to change the topic back to searching about the motor factory, he says, don't you really want to talk about your railroad? I mean, I can't promise anything, but I'm always open to a plea for mercy. And he's disappointed that she doesn't want right. to make and it. So we get the sense that maybe part of what people who place spiritual things, as Ivy says, over material things, hmm. who are with a height, a harp, uh, you know, get off on seeing people grovel or beg or something. Lawson, at any rate, seems to. Because he doesn't really seem, I mean, he talks a lot about caring about people. And some people on the, on the internet group uh, mentioned this. Lawson talks about caring about all the little people, but he can't remember any of their names, and neither can Ivy. So it seems um, this great friend of the workers isn't. Yeah. I just wanted to point out that I don't know if it's a logical progression, but as you're going through all these people that Dagny and Hank are running into, they're getting further and further away from the progression of motors, of the purpose of 20th, 20th century motors. No one's actually making motors. Right? Well, the like later the people models. in the progression operated the factory. So Ivy Starnes, you know, when Ivy Starnes was in charge, the factory ran. 
um, when uh, Hun Sacker was in charge, the factory ran. But when um, Mayor Boscom and Mark Jans were in charge, it didn't. So they're going back in time. And in that case, since um, they're going back towards when motors were made, I don't know that, um, I mean, none of these people strike me as uh, very good at making a motors or very interested in motors. But I don't know that the later ones are more interested in it than the last, than the earlier ones. None of them are oper. I mean, Bascom says, "Oh, I didn't operate it. I'm a practical person. Uh, I wouldn't want to do anything so unpractical as running a business. I just try to flip them." You know. Motor that outdid the existing one that they had. So they ma they're making a case, divine right of stagnation, that their motor should work, and just because. Jed Starnes, Starnes isn't here anymore. Um, he didn't have this competition with Ted Nielsen coming out with a new motor. Yeah, that's another good point. We're getting a sense of how these people thought about running their business. And this brings to some of the stuff you were going to talk about. Do you want to talk about um, the approach these people took to running the business? Which which people the um, the Vossens or the Hunsacker? The Hunsacker. Uh, Hunsacker. I think he's probably the best example of this. I'm the not theorist. sure which point you were thinking. I wanted to make about that. <laughs> well, just uh, this kind of divine right of stagnation point. Well, so, Robert just made that point pretty well. So, but yeah, well, go ahead. yeah. Well, Hans, when Hunsacker starts talking about how the tools of production are supposed to condition you. Yeah. That is the most explicitly Marxist view we've heard from any of the characters. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, is that no, Marxist, IB the base right. conditions the IB superstructure. according to yeah. his ability is also, that's, so, that's, that's literally Marxist. Um, yeah, that's literally mm -hmm. Marxist. Well, they're both literally Marxist views, um, but uh, the, um, well, first of all, we get Hunsacker before we get, um, we get the Starn there, so it's certainly the most Marxist thing we've got up to that moment. Um, and it's more like technical Marxist jargon than, um, even though the other thing is a quote from Marx, um, it's more brand name Marx, I think, this idea. But yeah, there's, there's this idea of uh, all of these people's conception of what it's like to run a business, and it, I think particularly pronounced and obvious in the case of Hunsacker, is, is very... Um, there's some procedure you go through. Um, maybe the means of production will condition it so that you can go through that procedure. And then you should expect to be able to turn a, a profit, right? Or you should be able to get money out of it. And it's very much like Mr. Moen. There's no idea there might be any creativity. You might have to change things. Uh, this Nielsen came up and, you know, no one gave me a motor to compete with his. Well, did you look in your research factory? Yeah, you know, what do I have to bother with that for? All right, well, let's, we can come back to some of these, these issues about the, the mentality behind the, the running of the, of the factory. Um, let's, I guess, shift to the, the Reardon and Dagny issues you, want, were, you were uh, suggesting before. Yeah, well, so, there's this, in when they're yeah, exchanging, uh, uh, when, they're, when they're having conversation with Bascom, Bascom makes a kind of off-color remark about Reardon, you and the lovely lady who is not your wife, insinuating right. that they're having a... An affair together because it, it yeah. he doesn't think that uh, married people look like that they have, they have the, yeah. a bedroom on the mind all right. the time. He views her as high class. Uh, Reardon Reardon gets upset with him and looks like he wants to slap him. That doesn't actually get mentioned, but right. <laughs> those of you playing the drinking game at home, can yeah. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the Dagny, however, is said you know asks Hank to calm down and says you should reflect on something he said. See if you recognize any part of it. And mm -hmm. I think this connects to what you're. Yeah. So, so yeah. Just so Bascom says, the lovely woman who is not your wife, right? Um, Reardon looks like he's in a rage. Daphne kind of steps in and says, "How did you know that he's not my wife?" And he kind of comes out with his uh, bits of his view of life, which include this: uh, married people don't look at each other as though they had the bedroom on their minds, and in effect, you can be good or happy, but not both in this life, and and so forth. And Dagny, you know, calms Reardon down. I asked him a question. He gave me an instructive answer. You know, don't beat him up. Um, and uh, let's be on our way. And uh, it's first worth noting Reardon's reaction to that in the car. It takes him quite a while, right? And his, before he's able to talk about it, and his first reaction is, 
you know, I wasn't able to protect you from him. Well, that's interesting in its own right, because for a few reasons. First of all, if Reardon was just seeing her as a piece of meat, and that was what this relationship was about, why would he be interested in protecting her in the first place? I mean, clearly she's important to her as a person, uh, him as a person, um, which we've known all along. But um, her response uh, is, I think, very contemporary. I don't need to be protected. Well, and he says she the she says that the mayor is just stating the truth. Why yeah. are you getting angry at somebody who's? And he says, well, it's his estimation of the truth that he has no business to. Um, or they says that truth was none of his business, and she says his estimation of it is none of yours or mine. What do we care what this jerky mayor of a bunch of trash thinks uh, thinks about our relationship? Yeah, Ellen. but also he said, well, my suggestion is you go buy a cheap paper wedding band. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, Hank can't do that because he's already married, which is the whole other issue. Well, that's but actually what he was saying to Dagny. Dagny mm -hmm. should buy the, right. the Oh, Dagny should buy yeah. herself a ring? So I don't think what he was saying is you should get married, you can do it cheap. After all, the guy's clearly rich. He's got this great car. If he was going to... convincing when you say you're Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Yeah, well, right. Yeah, they're already married. lying that they're married. And but so he's saying you can pull it off better if you have a wedding band. You can get one cheap. But I think really hit Hank though. I really do because that's the whole issue of that he's fighting mm -hmm. is that he can't give Dagny a ring to wear. Or he because I mean he's got the other monkey on his back. <laughs> so let's get to that monkey yeah. in a moment. Oh, yeah. Give her a bracelet, though. The the other, yeah, he did give her a bracelet, or she got the bracelet from the monkey. I guess I don't, if we're gonna keep with this <laughs> analogy. The so the other thing he says is she says like think, and this is a point Ben was drawing attention to. Uh, think about um, whether you recognize any part of what he said, and where would Hank recognize some part of what Bascom said from talked about the agony, yeah. Yeah. First scene. It's the same kind of sentiment, right? He was sharing uh, with her in his own estimate of her for wanting to sleep with him, him for wanting to sleep with her, uh, what they were going to do, you know, what their lives were going to be from now on, on the, on their first, you know, morning after. So it's an attitude that Hank, you know, disgusted by this guy's having it, uh, that Hank himself has. And indeed, maybe that's why, uh, maybe that's why um, Hank's concerned about the guys stating the truth or knowing the truth rather than about his estimation of it, because Hank shares the estimation. Mm -hmm. Anthony asks if everybody's, uh, every, it, uh, so Betsy points out, and I think that's important, that Dagny gave Hank time to calm down before she discussed it with him. And I think that's significant, and we're going to, how Dagny deals with the fact that she and Hank have very different opinions of the affair that they're having is a topic where I want us to think a lot about, but we'll have more occasion to start talking about it next week because we get a lot more content on it next week. Anthony Loy asks if everyone's cool with Hank Reardon having an affair. Well, definitely everyone's not. Hank's not, right? He's really not cool with it. Now, whether everyone here is cool with it, um, I don't know. Daphne's cool with it. Hank's not. What about you guys? I'm cool with it. Fine. There was, there was I, think should, I think you should leave Lillian and should, he should have left her ass years ago. That's what yeah, somebody uh, on the uh, discussion group was yeah. saying, divorce the... So most of the people in the room are fine with it. A number of the people on the discussion group aren't. And I, I think it's a difficult... I mean, certainly Hank, something's wrong in Hank's case, right? I mean, I don't think anybody thinks this is the best way to deal with the situation of you're being married to someone who you don't share any values in common with. She's always trying to trap you up in some kind of weird way. And there's someone else who you're in love with, but you don't understand exactly what love is uh, and you have contempt for it. I mean, it, probably what you should do is kind of get straight on your attitudes towards romance, leave the one and go with the other. I think that's, unless you don't think you should get divorced at all, Doran makes an interesting point. But there's something, yeah, that's a good, I'll hold, let's hold off on sure. that. But there's something, um, Reardon's really confused, and he's trying to deal with something, and he doesn't think he's dealing with it well, and we'll have to see how he does. But I think we'll just, it's something we have to follow over the course of a few chapters. Uh, Al? You know, what, one of the things that strikes me about this section uh, is that not only are 
Dagny and Reardon reacting to different uh, manifestations of evil or sloth or whatever, they are learning more about themselves from that interaction. And that's one of the, I, th I think that's one of the key features of Ayn Rand's writing is that there's looking at the external and looking at the internal. Extrospection, introspection. So we're learning more about Dagny and Reardon, but they're also learning more about themselves. Yeah, I think that's right. And that's one of the things I want us to talk more about towards the end of today when we look at the, talk about what's happened in the first part of the novel, because I think that aspect of it is going to really come center page as we move into parts two and three of the novel, where um, it's not true that these characters are static, even in part one. There's some growth to them. But um, what part one has primarily been about is this building of the John Galt line and its, its consequences. Part two is something else that's, I think, more primarily about in part three, developments with these characters. And so we want to kind of notice what kind of, how we're seeing that already in part one and what to be on the lookout for in part two. Um, let's, uh, Doran's raising some interesting points about, about Lillian. So let's, let's uh, shift to the topic of Lillian here. Do you want to say something first? Well, maybe here's a question that will get us into uh, what Doran's touching on, which is, so very early in their conversation, uh, she says, I'd like to remind you that I'm, I'm Mrs. Reardon, and she says that, uh, uh, what is it you businessmen always make such a big deal about, the sanctity of the contract? Well, let's, the, the first, before we even get to the sanctity of the contract issue, right, she, she shows up in his bedroom in a negligee, although it might be an evening, right. like Lillian seems not to be the sexiest when she's uh, got her... Uh, sexy outfit on but um she's coming in in this negligee he's startled that she's coming into his bedroom she's never done it before uh he's been avoiding her for months and his response is like hey, what are you doing here right uh and what do you want lillian isn't that even before that um or does she mention the contract thing before he contract asked what you want question or after i forget i think what you want is after. Certainly when the embrace is after. Mm -hmm. But uh, part of what I wanted to uh -huh. ask about with that is, I mean, is she is she insinuating at this point that she thinks that Reardon is cheating? Well, because it's hard to make sense of then, because what happens later, of course, is that she then tries to embrace him, and he feels this revulsion. Yeah. And she seems surprised that he feels revulsion, which, it makes me think maybe she wasn't insinuating it before, but well, what it's hard to know what she knows. Is um, when he says, "What do you want?" Isn't isn't one of the things that there's so much you could tell if you just thought to think about what I'd want. And one thing is, um, if you've been avoiding me for months, so obviously, wouldn't I want to know why? Right, and um, so. Uh, He's not avoided her in this way before, right? And he once in a while breaks down and goes to her bedroom. Seemingly he's not done that in a very long while. Um, she's now broken down and comes to him, not probably out of desire because we don't get the sense that she has much of that, and also because if she was really desiring him and that lust is what brought her to her bedroom, you think she'd like move a little bit more sexily in the negligee rather than making it look like a, a nightgown she's like I mean she she does comment on how he looks he looks great he looks younger right yeah uh, now you might think this is her expression of uh, being attracted to him but uh, of course she, she might also here be insinuating you know it looks like someone's been making you feel younger that's kind of what I got from it or I mean, was I guessing at I think she notices a change in him yeah. and Reardon thinks she notices a change in him and she's trying to figure out why and I think it's, it's very plausible that she suspects yeah. that it might be a mistress. I don't think we can tell that for sure from here. Doran has an interesting comment. What does Doran say? Doran says she's shocked. I presume he means when uh, she embraces him because she doesn't know with whom he's cheating. She thought he would regard her as no less desirable because he wouldn't have gotten anything fulfilling from the floozy. Yeah, I so think... If he's been cheating with a floozy, he's not going to feel any loyalty to the floozy. But the fact that she, when she tries to embrace him and he feels revulsion, and in fact, what we get from him is is precisely that he feels 
uh, uh, disloyalty, but not disloyalty to Lillian. Yeah, I want to read that passage in, in a moment. So let's open to it, the disloyalty. Yeah, right but she definitely knows that something's up with him, that he's not interacting with her the way that he normally does. Um, she has something she does with Reardon, right? There, she's the one who wants to stay there. She's the one who wants to stay with him. There's something she gets out of having the kind of interaction or relationship with Reardon she has. He's not doing his part of it. I mean, he well, avoids her in some way and doesn't give her any time or attention all the time. But now it's different. She knows now it's different. Probably she has some suspicions as to why. But even if she doesn't, you know, regardless of how exact her suspicion as to why is, she's, there's a change that she's concerned about, right? And she's trying to figure out what it is and maybe trying to do some of the things he thinks she needs him for or her for or somehow get back in with him or it's not clear exactly what she's trying to do, but she's trying to get or keep their thing going in some way, right? And I think we can speculate about in what detail. Maybe it's in the face of her suspicion that he's having an affair. And part of what she tries to do is embrace him. And what happens in the embrace? Were you going to read that passage? It's uh, really there, So I thought that you wanted a different passage, but the... Ready to go. It was the swift, instinctive, ferocious gesture of a young bridegroom at the unrequested contact of a whore, mm -hmm. the gesture with which he tore her arms off his body and threw her aside. Um, and whatever calculations she had made, this was a thing she had not expected. Right. So calculations is interesting, right? There's something she's, um, this is calculated, right? Um, and uh, everything with her is calculated, Robert says. But somehow this is this is unexpected. And then Reardon's reaction on it is the other passage about the disloyalty, which comes slightly right. later. So let's You want the rest of that? Yeah. I'm sorry, it's just that I'm very tired. He added his voice lifeless. He was broken by the triple lie, one part of which was a disloyalty he could not bear to face. It was not the disloyalty to Lillian. Right. So now he's got one of the things he's con he's noticing about himself now, and Al made this point about the characters noticing things about themselves, is he's also surprised by this um Fero for ferocity of his interaction, of her, his reaction to her. Now, we should have expected this. I mean, even when he was, like, looking at Daphne and he was turned on because he was looking at Daphne at the anniversary party, and that drew him to Lillian's bedroom, like, uh, somebody put it on the, for on the forum back then, you know, when he saw what was in the bed, he couldn't go through <laughs> with it. And I think there is a kind of disgust <laughs> reaction behind that. Now he's, you know, gotten uh, a lot... Uh, He's had more than just a look at Daphne, and the contrast, I think, is is sickening. But it's not just uh, – there's also the other element of his loyalty. So I think he's realizing and uh, having difficulty admitting or acknowledging it that um, there is love or a, a, an important bond, affection, the kind of thing that he thought this relationship wasn't and that he was incapable of going on with Daphne, and he's coming to understand that. Two other points about this scene, I think, um, require, you know, we, we require some attention. So one is the one you brought up about the contract, right? Right. Um, so what were you, would you, you either wanted to say or ask something about that? Or well, that was, that was earlier in mm -hmm. the scene. I think we, I think we got past that. that. That was just where I was asking whether she was already insinuating at this mm -hmm. point, whether she knew that he was cheating. And I was confused about it because why then would she be surprised when he feels revulsion? But I think Doran's comment explains that. Maybe yeah. she thinks he is cheating, but she doesn't realize he's cheating with somebody actually meaningful to him. I don't think she has the idea that he could, uh, from, I mean, this is, we can't get into, if we look at her psychology later and her views of him later, um, I, I definitely think that if she thought he was cheating, she would not expect it. That wouldn't lead her, as Dor I agree with Doran that it wouldn't lead her to expect him to react like that. Um, so I think Doran's right that if he did suspect it, then he wouldn't do that. But I think, and she may well suspect it, but she also might just have a more general suspicion. Something's up with him. He's not behaving in the normal way. Sure. And she's, he's broken his vow to her. And he really, you know, he thinks he's broken his vow to her. 
even apart from cheating on her, right? He's not been spending any time with her. He's not been, he doesn't really have a relationship with her. And from the way Lillian thinks of it, and this is, is um, what she specifically brings up when she uh, talks about welshing on your side of that contract. The way Lillian understands the contract is um, he's de promised, his side of the bargain, was promising to pledge his life to making her happy. And he doesn't have any idea what would make her happy. He's not sure if she's happy or not. He doesn't know anything about her life. He doesn't care. And he's not doing anything about it. All he knows is paying for things. You know, if she wants something, he'll buy it. But um, she, he's not trying to make her happy and he's not concerned with whether he is. And so in that sense, he's welched on the bargain. Now, if he's also cheating on her, all the more so. But that's enough um, for Lillian um, you know, I'm not saying she doesn't also suspect. She might, but that's the part she stresses. And the fact that he's now also cheating on her, and he knows that, makes Reardon regard her case as much more just. I mean, he already regarded it as somewhat just in, in Chapter 6, but now he really thinks, you know, she's in the right. And part of what's going on when he's regarding her as in the right is, and um, I think Harry pointed this out, uh, online um, that uh, he, yeah um, don't hate them for your own uh, guilt Harry says uh, Reardon told himself but he knew dimly that this was not the root of his hatred and and Harry points out that this echoes similar realizations he's had uh, he's had earlier um, uh, and Harry says he found it impossible to read one of these paragraphs. Uh, I guess he found it so disturbing until he examined it more carefully and understood that he didn't actually consider himself lower than this woman he despised. But he has this revulsion of... So, so um, what Harry's pointing out, and I think it's important, is Reardon has this... He's revolted by Lillian, right? He despises her. He thinks she's awful. Every instinct in him, every feeling he has just rebels against Lillian, and he has contempt for her. And yet his judgment is that he should think of himself as worse, as lower than her, because he's betrayed her, she's in the right here. And he's, um, part of him is rebelling against, uh, rebelling against this, um, this, uh, disgust he has at her, by saying, look, that's what any kind of guy in the wrong would do. He'd try to shift the blame to the other. The At the same party. time, Greg, uh, Ellen raises an interesting question. Wasn't marriage a mutual contract? And if, if uh, he were able to fulfill his end of the bargain, he would need to know what it was she wanted from mm -hmm. him. And half of his frustration in this scene is trying to figure out what that is. And she yeah, exactly. evades the question. And the last thing that we get is what she wants is him. Yeah. And this not is, in the gutter sense, and in what sense you wouldn't understand it. And uh, so it's some kind of non-materialistic sense of wanting Reardon. And it's interesting here because there's a number of other scenes in this chapter so far where we've seen people talking about higher ideals. And a particularly interesting comparison is Lawson, right, who, who, who professes to stand for this uh, higher non-material ideal. Uh, but it, we also course, saw a little bit about what the we, both Lawson and Starnes stood for this, and we saw a little bit about what uh, that also entailed. We were talking yeah. earlier about the exercise of power. And there, was a, there was a really good exchange on this between um, Carol and Pooja, um, like a number of messages back and forth, trying to analyze Lillian's character and get to the bottom of it. And uh, I, it didn't contain spoilers, but it contained um, a lot of ideas and statements that we'll be better able to evaluate later on, so I don't want to go into depth with it now, but I think they're reflecting on these issues of what does she want, why. And one thing that Pooja pointed out as part of it that um, I think is, is right in line, Ben, with what you're saying is she noticed that there is a kind of a progression to the questions that Reardon is asking. Right. First, um, what do you want, and then what principle, uh, what, what, what purpose, purpose do you, you live for? for? And then we get to the third question, which is really In the... In what sense do... The, do right. Uh, well, three. So it's, you know, what do you want, 
and and there's the you know you but not in the gutter sense and so forth and there's this idea of a more elevated sense but it's left kind of mysterious and unidentified in the way that Jim Taggart's everything that he was saying was higher than the things other people want is left mysterious and unidentified and a few people online um, I think Ellen maybe um, made a a point of do you see similarities between Lillian and James and I think there definitely are some we'll come back to that um, and then there's well what purpose do you live for and well maybe enlightened people don't don't live for a purpose and again we get this idea of um, there's some undefined thing that's better than what everyone else is and then um, the last of the questions that Pooja pointed out. Do you want to? Yeah, it's it's uh, she uh, she says they certainly don't. What do people do with their time? They don't spend it on manufacturing plumbing pipes. And he says, "Tell me, why do you keep making those cracks? I know that you feel contempt for the plumbing pipes. You've made that clear long ago. Your contempt means nothing to me. Why keep repeating it?" And this hits her enough for Reardon to notice that he wonders why he feels with absolute certainty that this had been the right thing to say. So why is that the right thing to say? What is it about, uh, and, and then that's what is followed by the discussion about how uh, she wants him, but not in a gutter mm -hmm. sense. So why is it that his reaction to her insults is so important? Well, and then he's noticing well, something yeah, about it. Uh, because she has nothing <clears throat> to say precisely because of that. She usually has all these you know, wise cracks that we've said before. Uh, but now he notices there's nothing really behind, what, like, or at least nothing intelligible behind why she says what she says. So he's kind of discovering that there really is no monster under the bed. It's just me. Well, I don't agree with that. I, I think she, she's goading him intentionally. I, I totally think she's like she's always, you know, plumbing pipes, really. But he usually takes it. He never kind of. No, you're it. right. And now okay. he's like mm -hmm. he sees it very clearly now. But I think I, I thought that you said it. that Lillian doesn't have a motive. Oh no, I mean, I mean, I mean, not not a reasonable motive like he assumed. Like not, I'm um, actually doing something wrong. So it, it, it's not a. Uh, she doesn't actually have any claim to her. Um, being upset with him is what I, and he's noticing it. Harry, he's rejecting the estimation of his be, some important aspect of him being contemptible. Because if her her saying uh, that it's contemptible had meant something to him before, and he was defensive, it was her hook into him, and she's lost that hook, and she doesn't know what to do <coughs> if she's lost that hook. I think that's why she comes to him. I don't think she was suspecting him of an affair. She mm -hmm. missed having that hook in. In, in him all these months because she gets something out of manipulating him with this contemptible wisecracking that he <coughs> grants her something that she's seeking repeatedly and she hasn't been getting her fix. Yeah, that's my take on it, too. Yeah. And so then what does that have to do with wanting him in some well, other sense? she wants whatever that is. Now, it might be that she, she started to wonder about why it is that he's not giving her that and maybe among her theories is that he's having an affair maybe among her theories is that the John Galt line went so well and that's somehow changed things but I think that she, she's not getting what she wants so I think we've got a lot of uh, interesting points on on the uh, on the online uh, Harry Mullins or Harry sorry uh, uh, we're trying not to use last names um, said means nothing equals has no hold over me Betsy says the jig is up, which is the same kind of uh, same kind of idea. Um, because um, he doesn't feel guilty about it. She, Laura, she I think, saying. glossing what Carrie M was saying, says, is it simply that she's getting a false sense of self-esteem from putting him down? Uh, that's a, one possible interpretation of what the hook is that Carrie M was talking about. Let's kind of think about this more as we go through the book and particularly think about it in connection with um, possible analogies between Jim Taggart and Daphne. Um, any other things from But it is interesting online? the way that she seems to be stopped in the same way that somebody like uh, Lawson was stopped when Dagny didn't seem to care mm -hmm. uh, to get his approval or to get, you know, or to you know, beg for mercy from him. Yeah. Al? Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if we're getting a, a, a clue to Ayn Rand's view of Reardon one that I, I don't know what it's a clue to exactly, but 
if you look at Dagny, she refers to Francisco Dancone as Francisco. Mm -hmm. She refers to Hank Reardon as Hank. Uh -huh. Ayn Rand, as the narrative, refers to Francisco and Reardon. Mm -hmm. And I think there's got to be a reason for that. Why, why? That was in chapter two. Everyone calls him Hank. She says. Yeah, yeah but, the, but the narrator always calls Reardon Reardon. I mean, this is an interesting question. I don't have an answer to exactly. But what, so in general, she calls male characters by their last name, female characters by their first names, so much so that she'll call Jim Taggart in a scene where Daphne is also there, like, um, which is kind of weird. Uh, Daphne will think of Jim as Taggart occasionally, although sometimes at least the sister, when it's clearly in her thoughts, she'll think of him as Jim. Um, Francisco is the one exception to this, and, um, and there's one other exception I can think of in the novel. And my sense is it's characters with really cool first names, uh, or, or first names that are in another language, like Francisco, you know. Uh, if it was Frank, it would be the last name, I think. Um, but I'm not, I don't, I don't, if there's some deeper significance to that, I don't know what it is. But let's keep an, let's keep an, uh, I have that. Ellen says it's the custom of the time, and I think that's right, Ellen. It, it, that that's my take on to why it's women by first name, men by last name. Uh, what men I, by last name is is kind of a professional way mm -hmm. of dealing with people, and if men are right. most of the ones who you're working with in this time right. period, that's the way it's. Going um, but I wonder why the exception for a couple of male characters, um, and I don't think it's the. Uh, the rest. But let's move. I don't think it's the personal relationships to Dagny because it's the narrator doing it rather than Daphne, but let's, you know, keep an eye, an eye on that. Ben, do you want to go to the issue of, let's, uh, just being mindful of the time, yeah. let's move on to talking about the regulations that are um, possibly, uh, <laughs> well, I have to quote this one. Doran says, uh, <laughs> Doran says it's Reardon steel, Reardon life, so it's got to be Reardon, Reardon. <laughs> um, but um, uh, let's move on to talking about the, um, the regulations that Eddie is pleading, or the whatever, the measures that Eddie is pleading with Daphne to come back and fight. Yeah, so uh, in a way, this is what both begins and brings to a close the chapter mm -hmm. because Dagny is first, she's in Wisconsin and she gets a call from Eddie, says they're trying to kill Colorado. Uh, she says she'll come back right away. She does, she finds out that there's a whole series of policies being pushed uh, by various interest groups that are going to, in one way or another, restrict both her and Reardon's ability to succeed uh, at what they're doing, both in Col Colorado and elsewhere. Uh, and, well, let's, and of course, what happens is that they get implemented at the end of the chapter. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a second, but let's, let's maybe get clear first on what those policies are. So what what do people want, and then what do they get to do uh, at the end with, with both uh, Tagger Transcontinental and, and Reardon Steel? Well, I think people here should know. There's seven of them listed right in the row and a half a page. So what are they going to do to the trains? So limit the number of the trains, limit the speed of the trains. Uh, what are they going to do with uh, with production of, of steel and other goods? No, it has to, you can't uh, produce any more than the output of other steel mills of equal capacity. So they're equalizing everybody. You can't run uh, as more than a certain number of trains into other states. And not just equalizing the production of the steel, mm -hmm. but also what the, about distribution. the distribution. So anybody who asks for it has to get it as the fair share uh, component of it. And move out of states, their production facility. All these people were leaving the East Coast, the kind that Mr. Moen was complaining about going to Colorado, that's out. And remember, he was the one who said there ought to be a law. And he got it. And uh, one last, with particular relevance to Colorado. Special one state oh, tax on Colorado. State tax. Yep. Yeah. The real world would be clearly unconstitutional, but who reads the Constitution? In the real world, also. <laughs> there is an emergencies powers clause. Ah, and that's something I wanted to get at because I don't know if you all noticed there was a slight difference between the policies that were demanded at the beginning of the chapter and then the ones that were actually implemented at the end. 
Uh, and it's that the, what they were, for the most part, what they were demanding were that laws be passed. Um, and you know, presumably by the legislature. This is the way policies have been implemented up to this point in the novel. The, and the Equalization of Opportunity Bill was brought to the floor of the legislature uh, through underhanded means, but it was still passed. Uh, but they're not passed as laws at the end. They're passed as emergency decrees. And there was a hint at the beginning that, that Mauch was you know, fishing for emergency powers. So, so the only law that gets passed is a law granting emergency powers. So there's a kind of a sea change that occurs at this point in the political situation of the novel, and we're going to have to we're going to have to see how that goes. Uh, we posted a question in the online discussion group about not just what were these regulations, but what was the motivation for them, and what kind of uh, more broadly what kind of mentality seemed to be behind them. And we got a lot of comments, at least on the topic of the, the rationalization or the justification for these policies um, and how they were reflected in various people's uh, attitudes earlier in the, in the chapter. Um, Seth, in the online discussion, said, we've seen this mentality throughout the book. It punishes the successful and rewards sloth. The whole leveling the playing field is about cutting down the successful to the lowest common denominator. And I definitely think that there's something about that that's right. We've seen that coming from uh, we've seen that coming from Lawson, we've seen that coming from Hunsacker, we've seen it coming from Lily, uh, uh, Ivy, Ivy Starnes. Uh, uh, we've even seen it, but we haven't just seen it among kind of the social reformer types. Uh, we've also seen it from the business people that, that uh, Dagny is dealing with. And I mentioned Mr. Moan before, but of course when she's, when she's back on, in New York and trying to deal with these, how is James uh, reacting when she says, we've got to do something about this, James? Is he saying, yeah, I'll get my men, on, men in Washington on it right away? No, I mean, he says they've, you know, they've got a point. Uh, that, uh, you know, the union has a point. It's uh, not fair for us to get all the benefit of this. Um, this is one of the kinds of comments that makes Dagny even wonder uh, dimly, the same word, uh, whether it was really self-interest that was motivating Jim, so maybe he, she wouldn't be able to rely on that uh, for him to get things done. And also Larkin, right? Uh, Reardon's friend, who we had had a previous exchange with where he was really trying to reassure Hank that Hank was going to get his oar, but lo and behold, he doesn't get it. And what do we find out about why? Why hasn't, why hasn't Larkin been delivering? Now, of course, part of it is, oh, it wasn't my fault. It couldn't be helped. This is the same thing as usual from him. But there's been some more specifics that we find out about why he allegedly couldn't help it. He's been helping Orrin Boyle. And on the grounds of what? Made a deal in top and bottom, basically. Chapter well, <laughs> that's, the, that's not the point that he mentions, of course. But I mean, the kind of justification he, he's giving is, but well, Larkin, or Boyle needs it. And why yeah. should you get everything, Hank? Right. And, and likewise with why isn't he using the lake shippers who uh, Reardon's concerned about because he thinks that they'll, the lake shippers will go out, of, will go out of business and then there won't be lake shipping that they can use. Why, why does he, and why the, does Larkin and instead? The lake shippers aren't cheaper. He's paying more for the railroad. Right. Right. So why is he, why is he paying more for Taggart? What's his reason with Taggart? We have to support the railroads. But specifically the Minnesota branch yes. because yes. It's running at a deficit. deficit. They need it, yeah. right? So it's the mm -hmm. same. It's the same kind of thing, uh, even from the business people in the book. Uh, and he, even if you go beyond the social reformers and beyond the business people, to Lillian, there's a similar kind of that. Where does Lillian say something along the lines of uh, people? It's not fair for people to only get things that they can pay for because they're better at what they do. You know, if you tell a woman she's beautiful, and she is, you haven't really done anything. But if she isn't, she is. Or and not just beauty, but that she, she goes on to the point of if you love someone for their virtues, uh, you're not giving them anything. But if you love them in spite of their vice, then that's for true. Their vice, you might even for their vice, yeah, you're right. Then that's true self-sacrifice. And so it's the same kind of uh, 
the same kind of idea behind the scenes here. Well, you know, Al mentioned Babbitt. I keep thinking of the Patience, Gilbert and Sullivan, where they finally persuade Patience, well, true love has to be unselfish. And she concludes, therefore, loving her childhood playmate, who is all so perfect, wouldn't be in the least unselfish. She ought to love Bunform because he's so repulsive. <laughs> I don't know as much Gilbert Sull Sullivan as you do, so you. you I, I don't know that it. much of it either. Although I like the little bit I do. You always use some to do mic tests, but anyway. Uh, well, patter songs are good for mic tests. They just kind of go on. Anyway, go on then. So I think it's it is clear that there's some kind of I mean you might call this a kind of egalitarian uh, philosophical view that's behind a lot of the different thoughts of the different characters in this chapter and also behind uh, the passage of these well not the passage but the implementation of these decrees is there anything beyond that that you can see in the mentality behind these laws these decrees. Not I mean, so much of the... But beyond that, it, it's not necessarily standing behind that, but like deeper than that, but just yeah. in addition to that. So these are two elements. There's uh, egalitarianism and there's trying to get one over on the other person, I guess we saw. Well, so it's, I think you, you mentioned the progression uh, from uh, in the cases of the people that mm -hmm. Dagny interviews and the reason that I wanted to hold that up until now is because, well, what is, you start with Dagny interviewing Lawson, who's, you know, sitting at his desk like a bomber pilot, commanding a national economy, and he's, you know, who thinks he's on the top of the world. Mm -hmm. and then we go to Lee Hunsacker, who is sitting in his kitchen cooking his pea soup. Not uh, his kitchen, even. It's, it's not his. These friends of mine. Do you know what out. she did? <laughs> She left those dishes in the sink thinking that I was going to Yeah, clean I have that thought every other day at my <laughs> house, uh, uh, thinking about domestic. And things. then we get to the Starnes in Louisiana. And Louisiana doesn't come out very well in, in, uh, in Atlas Shrugged, I'm sorry to say. It's like, all the, <laughs> it's like all the trash in the country has been flushed down there. Uh, this is not the only case of it. But, uh, and we have like somebody like Eric Starnes who, who commits suicide on his unrequited love's uh, wedding bed mm -hmm. and we and we and then we have someone like Gerald Starnes who's he's now to the point where he's you know living in a flop house and stealing nickels from other beggars mm -hmm. so there's like they, they're all sort of on the same principle of uh, you know nobody gave us a chance and so we ought to get our fair share but that we see kind of the end point of this with Gerald Starnes or maybe with Ivy Starnes in a more symbolic way and there's kind of this diminishing range of sight that each of these characters is shown as having? I mean, I, I see this, I guess you can put it that way, that there's a diminishing range of sight in those characters. I mean, I think there's a, the, the more striking feature to me about what's diminishing is their stature and their view of, of mankind. Um, but they all have a, because you don't get the sense that any of these, these people are thinking long range. Now, now, it is true that stealing a nickel from the bum next to you is particularly, uh, particularly short range. And this does bring to the issue of range we were talking about. Let's, there's a few other, I mean, people online have talked about it being pro cronyism and government by pressure group. Um, and, uh, and I think... Uh, I think that's true, that this is a, it's a kind of thing that public choice theory uh, studies and uh, little factions warring against each other. But one of the things that's, that's senseless or that's striking and particularly striking to Dagny when she's looking at it about these bills is, or they're not bills, they're, they're, maybe they're proposed as bills originally and they eventually, these measures that people are asking for and that which Mouch eventually uh, passes his directives, um, is, you can call them short range, I think that's an important part of them, um, call them cannibalistic, <clears throat> they're on the premise that Ellis Wyatt um, 
mentioned at the very beginning of the novel, right? Or at the very beginning, at, in, in, back in chapter four, I guess it was, when uh, the uh, anti-dog eat dog bill uh, or um, rule was passed, and this meant that uh, he was going to have to depend on Tacker Transcontinental for uh, for um, for uh, transportation. He didn't think they could provide it. And what did he think? He thought that. Are you finding that passage? I'm looking for it. Yeah, can pull it up. That would be great. It's um, he thinks that most of mankind is on a certain policy, and that this rule and Jim's maneuvering behind the scenes to create this rule is uh, is an example of this policy. And what is the policy? Yeah. So he says, uh, I know that this is what you pe you people intend to do. You expect to feed off me while you can, and to find another carcass to pick dry after you have finished mine. That's the policy of most of mankind today. So here is my ultimatum. It's now in your power to destroy me. I may have to go, but if I go, I'll make sure that I take all the rest of you along with me, which is something we'll get to later. Yeah, and we'll see uh, that he does. Uh, I mean, something dramatic when he goes, right? We have seen, we read it all. But what is Dagny's word? It's not just Dagny, but uh, we've seen this word now a few times in the last couple of chapters. What is Dagny's word for this kind of policy, the kind of policy that Wyatt thinks that people, uh, that, that Jim is on? I think rightly it's thinks that word Jim that, is on. That is, this book is kind of famous it's for a word attributing the, to this kind of policy. The, the word, Dagny uses it. Reardon uses it. We've seen Ken Daniger use it. Um, does anyone, it's a word you ne rarely ever hear uh, except in a, a very different context. Robert? Looter. Looter. Yeah. Looter, looting. <laughs> there, these are looter politicians. They're Betsy looter measures. That. Betsy online says looting. So looting, looter. looter Intellectuals of the looter persuasion. Exactly. So what is a looter literally? I mean, what, what context do we normally use this word? When you take stuff that's not yours. So but, but that's the synonym that. for stealing. So it is a, a, a synonym for stealing, um, or it's a type of stealing, maybe. But in what context do we use the word loot as opposed to, like... Riots, war. natural <laughs> disasters. Riots, yeah. natural disasters, Ben says Robert says some kind of panic. I mean, there's a flood, and then somebody breaks all the shop windows and takes all the stuff out of the stores. It's a, yeah, uh, Al? Where the, the thieves are not worried about consequences because of the emergency situation of the disaster. Good, because there's some kind of emergency situation or disaster or breakdown or because of some reason, there's a, a widespread phenomenon of people not worrying about consequences. They're rushing to grab the stuff that's there in a don't think about tomorrow manner. So it's you're, you're treating life as though it's some kind of an emergency, maybe it's because you are in an emergency, and just grabbing what's there to be grabbed. You're, you're um, uh, grabbing what's there to be grabbed, and you're not thinking about uh, how the stuff will be replenished. You're not thinking about the long term. You're not thinking how to create something. You're in particular not thinking about how to produce. It's as though the stuff's just there and you grab it. And now if, if the stuff has to be produced by someone and you're just grabbing it from them, what you're doing is you're cannibalizing if you're acting like a looter. And, but to call it looter rather than cannibal is to stress the what? The kind of uh, super short-sightedness of it, the thoughtlessness of it, the just perceptual level grabbing at things of it, and the kind of panicky emergency-ish nature of it, of the th kind of thinking. Yeah, Anna? I was picking up, you said perceptual level, and that is part of the mentality that I thought of because even the laws are perceptual, I mean, not perceptual, they're concrete, they're sp very specific. If you've ever seen a list of rules or laws put out by the FDA over a period of many, many years, you'll see that they're very, very specific. There's like a law for this type of food and a law for this type of, and so they say, you know, you can't have more than 60 of this and you can't have more than 60 of that. And it's, it's just very, um, it, yeah. it shows how, even how they, how they have to think about it when they, they can't, <laughs> There was no way to say. There's no way to say it on a different level. I was struck by uh, how you see this kind of mentality coming out of the conversation between James and Dagny. Yeah, I think where it's specifically there, Go close ahead. to the beginning, where she first hears about all these kinds of mm -hmm. uh, proposals, and he indicates that he's he doesn't see a necessity for panic. 
but she starts asking these questions. You know, we we need every little bit of uh, mm -hmm. profit on these uh, from these fares to uh -huh. make this run because all of our other lines are running at a deficit. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, where you know, how are we going to pay for all this? And mm -hmm. in each case, every question she asks, he he did not answer. Right. He did not answer, and he just he doesn't he doesn't think he needs to consider the day after tomorrow when assessing the impact mm -hmm. of these policies. And you also see the same kind of attitude. Now he says he, he will uh, take care of Taggart transcontinental interest, but then how does he take care of Taggart transcontinental interest? Well, apparently the bondholders who are paying, uh, who Taggart is paying interest to are not going to be are not going to be paid. Right. So he, so he takes care of Taggart Transcontinental's interests, by not by finding a way for Taggart Transcontinental to keep on producing something and making money, but by finding some money they can seize uh, in exchange for letting other people... Seize them. Yeah, seize, feed off them. And what was the... Um, he gets Colorado to pay, Paul says. Um, and what was... I, I, what I found particularly interesting, and you were noting it when we were talking earlier, was the the way Jim voices the defense of the. Um, could we look back at those passages of the, you know, the other people, the unions, and these there's people something to be said for the union's viewpoint too. With so many railroads closing and so many railroad men out of work, they feel that those extra speeds you've established in the Rio Norte line are unfair. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so this is more it's unfair for enough. us to get the benefit of that new reel they want to share it to. There's, was it was it Larkin or Jim? Somebody makes a point of when some people are rich, right? Um, uh, oh no, sorry, it was Lawson when he's talking about um, why or so. I, I, I think so. Keep yeah, it's Lawson when he's talking. It's Lawson or Hunter. It's one of the people uh, talk, talking about the failure of the the faculty, when some people are still rich, when there are still people with money, how can we let um, uh, a bank collapse, let this or that happen, right? Yeah, I don't remember the specific passage. That you're um, about. There are a lot of passages like this later in the novel, yeah. I'll say. But there was one here I noticed. I'm forgetting exactly where it is. And if anybody notices it, um, uh, post it in the, in the comment thread. But there is, you know, while some people have money, how can we let such and such happen? Um, it's the Peter Singer view. It's a, yeah, the view of Peter Singer, of a lot of moral philosophers. Um, one, one person, this blogger who blogged his way through the book, Daylight Atheist, who I posted, a uh, very critical, not fan of Ayn Rand, uh, but has interesting observations, and he goes chapter by chapter, posted about this chapter actually on a similar kind of view, um, from a similar kind of viewpoint, saying, you know, how can Ayn Rand, uh, um, in Ayn Rand's world, we don't have apparently... Uh, things like a deposit insurance. Otherwise, nobody would have been hurt when the banks went bust. <laughs> so she's, um, so she's, you know, making it seem horrible, but but only because she's not allowing for these policies she's against. But of course, in Venezuela, they've got all kinds of, the, I mean, you know, these things only help you so long as there are uh, people to take the money from, right? And if there's nobody, if the policies are such that no one's able to make money under them, you're going to run out of people to take the money to to redistribute it. So that's why um, whatever you think of federal deposit insurance programs, and Rand, of course, was opposed to them, you can't imagine that, you know, countries that have them will never be hurt when banks go bust. I think we should move on to uh, the last topic of, in light of the time, Dagny and Reardon's decisions. Yes. Yeah, so the issues, what they're facing with these laws, right, is laws that are on this looting premise this short-sighted, cannibalistic premise, the same kind of short-sighted, non-productive, how can we seize and get things without doing work premise that um, we see a lot of in the later people trying to run the, the um, 20th century motor company. I don't think this is the dominant motive with the Starnes heirs running it, although we'll get to see more about their motives later, but people like Hunsacker and Boscombe who are trying to make a quick buck out of it without doing any work. Uh, it seems to be their motive. And uh, it's that mixed with these humanitarian motives, which seem to be more what drove Gene Lawson and the Starnes heirs. Um, but both of them, Dagny and Reardon, see as short-sighted, as irrational, and as you can't, these laws don't make any sense. And they're going to, ru they're going to destroy the country. They're going to keep running things down. And so they would want to fight them. But why don't they? Why don't they fight those? Because they both come back 
uh, having it in mind to try to fight them, and they don't. So why not? Too busy. Yeah. Okay, so let's take it person by person. Let's start with Reardon. What are Reardon's reasons? He's too busy doing what? Running his business. Running his business? Running or... Particularly, he has an emergency with his business, right? Because now he can't get ore. And a few people online uh, noticed this before. Puja and I think a few others um, noticed it. Yeah, Reardon can't get ore. Um, because of this Larkin. Because problem. of this Larkin phenomenon. Yeah. So he now has to go around scavenger hunting for ore. And he has all these orders to fill. Yeah. And he's having to behave like a criminal, furtively mm -hmm. having these meetings yeah. where he doesn't know if he can trust the people. He's been reduced to this kind of short-range mentality against mm -hmm. his will. But yeah, which is really an important point. Um, we were talking at this conference over the weekend and on a supplemental episode about this idea of Rand that force paralyzes the mind and negates the mind and cuts off the type of functioning that is characteristic of a Reardon. And we see that uh, happening to Reardon here. Carry on. Uh, yeah, well, Dagny's reason is different. She makes a deliberate choice, and we see her doing this down in the vault when she puts the uh, broken mm -hmm. motor down in there. And she stops and pauses and says, hmm, I can go to Washington and try to find out, uh, and get, find the trail to lead me to the, the man who made this motor, or I could uh, try to uh, fight these people. And when she thinks about trying to fight them, she says like, she has no weapons to fight unreasoned people who won't think, who have no purpose, who won't define stuff. And she feels completely defenseless in the, the face of that. And so she deliberately chooses to take the other route because she can't combat these people. That's, that's what Jim does. But even that's where she has that lurking suspicion that, well, she's counting on Jim's self-interest, but she doesn't think that motivates him. So there's a question mark there. Here. So one is that Dagny makes a deliberate choice yeah. to do something else instead. Yeah. Now, I think that's true of Reardon, too. And it says, I mean, he could continue to run the mills and, and find the ore uh, or fight the laws and not do both. And he could have said, look, I'm going to make my orders be late this month. And so both of them make a choice. Um, now, on Dagny's side, the choice is motivated by, well, it, her choice is not to, is to uh, f go pursuing the inventor of the motor. And we want to talk about why that's so important to her. But part of, so that's the plus on the other side of the choice, right? Yeah. And part of the minus on the side of, well, uh, of, um, not fighting the laws is she feels disarmed. She doesn't think there's anything she can do. And part of what's interesting to me about that is it seems like she's regarding fighting the laws as some kind of a duty or obligation, right? Because she tells herself like, what she really wants to do is clearly pursue this motor inventor. And she tells herself if she could come up with anything to do to, to fight the laws, um, she would do that instead of finding, you know, pursuing her motor increase, which is what she really wants. But then for the reasons you say she can't, uh, and she leaves it to Jim. And Ben, you had some thoughts about what a, why she can't or, or how... Well, there's this passage on page 298 in the Standard Edition, which mm -hmm. reminds me of something we've seen from her before. Uh, helplessness was a strange experience, new to her. We've talked about that. Uh, she had never found it hard to face things and make decisions, but she was not dealing with things. This was a fog without shapes or definitions in which something kept forming and shifting before it could, see, could be seen like semi-clots in a not quite liquid. It was as if her eyes were reduced to side vision. She was sensing blurs of disaster coiling toward her. So you also get the sense that there's a kind of, she's being forced into a short-term mentality against her own will. But you also get the, it's the same kind of imagery that you talked about before, I think maybe chapter six, uh, the cotton. Mm -hmm. This imagery of something unsubstantial that doesn't seem like it should be the kind of thing that can bar your way, but that does, right? That was the cotton. It yeah. slows and you down, it's gross, it's icky, but it's not an enemy you can fight. And now, uh, in the cotton case, she just goes and does her thing, despite the cotton. Right, she. Uh, there's all these people, and they try to stop her, and they try to, but they're not really. Her, what she does isn't really fight Jim or fight the board of directors. She just runs the railroad sort of despite them, and kind of powers through it, and and they don't really stop her. They just slow her down or make it difficult. Now, what she would have to do, or what Eddie's calling on her to do, is like fight the cotton or the semi blobs. Actually, think about them and how to deal with them, rather than just act despite them, and that's what 
she can't find and a when way she, to do. I mean, when she tries to think about what it would mean to mm -hmm. do that, that's mm -hmm. where she's paralyzed. Could she delay it in order to argue with Orrin Boyle, to reason with Mr. Moen, to plead with Bertram Scudder? She saw the motor completed built into an engine that right. pulled a train, et cetera. She can't even, I mean, what, what is she going to say to these people? Yeah. It's, it's, it's not like there's this evil uh, conspirator out there that she's doing a nemesis of hers. Uh -huh. And if only she could, you know, have an honorable battle with this person, right. she could win. It's just this And Pooja's quoting the quote about it, not a superior ability which you would have found honor in challenging. Yeah, so... It's page 52 of the standard uh, edition. She wouldn't... Look at that. It's not a fight that there'd be kind of honor and uh, you'd feel your abilities called upon to do it. She also doesn't know how to do it. There's something gross about it. And then we can add to all of that it, it, that there's this other inspiring thing she could be doing. Um, so what about Reardon? Yeah, now Reardon has the same issue, right? He doesn't know how to think about this kind of thing. He's a sense there's a kind of problem to be solved here, but he doesn't know what it is. He doesn't know how to solve this kind of problem, um, how to kind of manipulate people or deal with these shenanigans. Uh, his business manager says it's, you know, can't have this, you either know how to run the mills or know how to run to Washington, right? But he only knows how to offer value for value, and right. uh, that's not what these people are looking for. What were the weapons he thought if values were not a weapon? And anymore? I don't think we know what the weapons are in this other realm yet. We have no, none of the characters have really identified it outright. But it's the kind of thing that Jim Taggart does. Maybe it's the kind of thing that Lillian does in a different realm. Um, it's certainly the kind of thing that Jim does. Reardon doesn't know what it is. No one's identified it. And um, I don't think we should try to identify it here yet because I think part of what's going to happen is the characters are going to try to identify it in the second part. But, Will, if you have something you want to say on this. Uh, yes. yeah. Actually, we are told that Midas Mulligan had dropped a hint of it. Mm. They said, Very good point. What, someone asked him, what's worse than the man without pity? And he said, the man who uses another man's pity as a weapon. Mm -hmm. uh, so part of what might be going on in this case, and maybe it seems like Lillian seems like the most striking example of this, or maybe also the rest of Hank's family, his mother and Philip, uh, is maybe they're using Hank's pity for them as a weapon against them. Maybe that's the way to fight these economic regulations too, although Mulligan says it's contemptible. So... Should Hank then try doing it, or there's some way to deal with the contemptible method? It Let's, is yeah. interesting that whether or not Reardon has contempt for Lillian is uh, something that comes up in this, this scene mm. where he says that's the right thing to say. There was some yeah. important realization he made there uh, about what she was after. So we shouldn't say more about that. Let's not lose the, the units we're holding here. So the question we're asking is, why don't they fight? And we've got two types of reasons so far. One is there's something weird about this fight. It's not a kind of fight they know how to fight. And, that they're mo and it's not a kind of fight they're motivated to fight. They get that it's necessary to sometimes, but they don't know how to do it. And unlike the fights that have to do with figuring out how to solve problems for producing things, these fights that have to do with figuring out how to deal with these looter types are not ones they know how to deal with and are not ones they're interested in, although they convince themselves for good reason that they have to get interested in them. Uh, then they both have other things that they're inclined to do or need to do. In Reardon's case, um, the ore problem, right? Solve the ore problem. There's one other big factor in Reardon's case. Robert? Yeah, he's going to fight the looters, but the wrath and fire was gone. He would fight, but only as one guilty wretch against the others. So he has this... He's, He's paralyzed morally now because, as Ben said earlier, who, who am I to cast the first stone? So he has that guilt of the affair, and now everybody, so he's lost the moral high ground exactly. in what he's done. Mm -hmm. So the other factor that we have to add in in Reardon's case is that he'll fight, and he has contempt for what the people are doing, but he can't hold himself up as I'm good and they're bad. I'm honorable and they're dishonorable. I'm in the right. Because, well, what are they doing? They're cheating, they're breaking contracts, they're violating things, they're, they're trying to get things that aren't theirs by right. But he's broken his marriage vows with Lillian. He's, not do, he's lying and being dishonorable. Um, he's signing registers as Mr. and Mrs. Smith and so forth. Um, so really, is he any better? And that, 
undermines his motivation to do this. He'll still fight, but he can't feel sure of himself. Here's something paradoxical about this. For a guy who feels so guilty, page 303, mm -hmm. uh, he, it, we're told he did not know that it was his rigid honesty and ruthless sense of justice that were now knocking his only weapon out of his hands. Mm -hmm. So he's, the, part of the reason why he's disarmed here is, part of it is because he's got this rigid sense of honesty. It's because he's someone who takes morality really seriously. And that's what would have made it such a strong, uh, uh, so powerful a weapon in his hands. And this is something we're really gonna wanna think about in part two. I want to move on to just one more aspect of, of Dabney's character with this. So what have we said about Dabney on this point of why she doesn't fight the looters? Well, there are a, a few elements, right? She makes a deliberate choice, okay, so does Reardon, to do something else instead of fighting the looters. In her case, it's to search for the inventor of the motor. And it's in a context where she doesn't really think she can solve the problem. Now, she also thinks she can leave it to Jim, although she knows she can't really trust Jim to do it, but she has to leave it to Jim, that's his job. But why is she trying to find the inventor of the motor? Anyone? Mohammed? It might make all of the <clears throat> trouble she has to go through worth it, in the sense that it doesn't matter if they're, I mean, I mean, do you want the specific reason? It, it, I'll start from specific. Right, right. right. The, to make, to use the engines to have faster trains, but the longer, um, <clears throat> term implications, it will make all of this kind of worth it. Uh, because now we'll be able to have a, right. a kind of railroad we want to have. Right, and so good and, you know... And the kind of economy and country mm -hmm. And it gets better from there, uh, presumably. Mm -hmm. Carry on. And she specifically says a mind like his, the inventor of the motor, would know how to win this battle. Right? Good. So he, his mind could apprehend the totality of it and solve everything. Not just the, the railroad, everything. Yeah, his, his she's mind got is superior. the sense that there's a kind of problem here she doesn't know how to deal with. Now that's, a, a, but and that he would, that's a little bit of a weird thought to have. Like, this guy can make a much better motor than anybody I know. He's a scientific genius. Therefore, he could solve my work and political problems. Like, why, why does she think that way about it? Why does this motor maker mean that to her? She wants to use against him and let him tell her what to do. I mean, it is very... It's yeah, she powerful. does definitely yeah. think that way. Yeah. So and she says, mm -hmm. um, I mean, granted, she is part of what she's thinking about when she's going for the motor is the kind of world we could have with a motor like this in it and, and how much it's, you know, and how could she deal with this stupid argument about 50 miles an hour or 60 miles an hour when we could uh, have trains going 200 miles an hour if we had this motor. But she also says part of it was she wanted it to keep her going. Um, and part of that is this there's something she doesn't know how to deal with in the world that this kind of a guy would. And this kind of thing has come up before, and oddly, with reference to language about motors, right? She's usually the motive power of her own happiness, but sometimes she needs somebody to pull her along. An achievement is the greatest gift. The sight of an achievement? Yeah, yeah but when, when she was in the, the little side office, the hobble of the John Galt line, she was slumped across the desk, realizing she had this um, romantic longing for some man who is capable of this, she finds a motor, she's like, damn, he exists, there's a mind who made well, She this. doesn't even know that he's a man at this point. Well, <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. Although she's the this only is just woman the in industry in this whole world. Point of the time. <laughs> Whether this person is a man or a woman, but she's imagining. But she does assume it. No, she, she does assume she does. he would yeah, know. Yeah. So uh, the man who invented the motor. She leaps to the assumption that it's a dude. Okay. <laughs> so and but she's longing for somebody yeah. who's capable of this, who's who's great, her has this greatness that even outstrips her own level of achievement that she's been longing for in this romantic sense. And she even outstrips Reardon's and Francisco's because yeah. if you think about the hierarchy of so. Um, Reardon is the most, Reardon and Francisco are the most capable guys we've met in this story so far. So Dagny is a really excellent railroad executive. There's probably someone like Dagny in every generation, maybe a bunch of them. Reardon is, invented a new metal 
and coming from nothing. I mean, Reardon a, is a is not just one more great business person, which he is. He's also a great inventor. He's a real scientist. He's at a level. Francisco, when he was a kid, I mean, he hasn't. Um, he's kind of been goofing off, it seems, and inventing these melting party palaces or something. <laughs> Um, but uh, instead of what you'd think he would do, but he's like, when he was a kid, everything he did he was just awesome at, um, and it looked like he would like put Reardon to shame, you know, like if you think of the kind of guy Francisco was when he was a kid, although then it didn't pan out, and yet he seems like he is still kind of like that. So, but Francisco's smarter than Daphne, it seems, or she seems to think she always looked up to him, um, but he, we don't know what happened to Francisco. Reardon is someone she can look up to, and in a number of respects, um, both he's more accomplished than her, and her greatest accomplishment has to do with recognizing his great accomplishment and and use it, making full use of it. But also, when Dagny's motivation is shot, Reardon's the one who can be a rock that she can look to. She's crying in a in a site in, in her carriage at the the side of the line when he when the equalization of opportunity bill comes up, he just thinks she's got a cold, right? But she's crying, and she's the one who can inspire her and keep her going. Um, but she, but he's also got some flaws. Yeah. And she knows that. And it's a source of at least a mild frustration for her. I mean, she kind of laughs at it. but And more generally, yes, I was definitely read about Reardon in particular, and we know Francisco's in some way proved a disappointment. But even... Aside from the particular shortcomings of these two guys, whatever they might be, Dagny's someone for whom the world is desolate. And these people, Francisco, it's not like, you know, Francisco's awesome and I've got a great boyfriend and my life is good, right? Uh, Francisco was like the one bright light, the shining, the example of the world that was to come that I could get into, rather than this abysmal crap that I'm surrounded with of people I feel boredom and contempt for and there's nobody worth dealing with. I know Francisco's coming, you know, but it's not like a, a Francisco-ish world. It's a world that's bleak and then there's a Francisco in it. And it's worse now as she grew up. She thought at least when I grew up, it would be like the Francisco world, but it's not. And now there's a Reardon in it. So these are kind of bright points in a, a crummy world. Um, and particularly uh, what the world is lacking is brilliance, excitement, a mind uh, uh, equal to her own. Now in some ways Reardon and Francisco are a superior, but she's it's a real metaphysical personal deep issue to her that she doesn't have this kind of thing in her life or not enough of it. And so she's prone to connecting, and, and I think this is connected to the romantic frustration, whether she literally thinks the, the, the guy who made the motor is going to be uh, you know, a romantic prospect or not. I mean, she seems not to notice that someone's a romantic prospect while she's flirting with him. Um, I mean, so you know, it's unlikely that she's literally thinking this guy will, although we might as readers think it. But... Um, but there's this kind of set of longings she has uh, that seeing this motor is like, so there are historical analogs to uh, somebody inventing a new, uh, a new metal. Uh, this motor would be um, a revolution in physics. And it's not clear that there's any historical figure who would be as great as this motor maker was. Um, uh, some combination of Newton and Einstein and, you know, who knows, and, and Thomas Edison or something. Um, so there's a kind of profundity of there's a mind like this. And that opens up new... Po it's, that means it's the kind of world where there are minds like this. And that thought is going to be a big deal, I think, for both Dagny and in a different way for Reardon in the chapters to come. So... We'll have occasion you, to talk you, about We that. talked about before, and I can't remember if we talked about this in the last broadcast. Remind me if we did. About the what happens at the end of the last chapter, where uh, there's this difference between Reardon and uh, Dagny as regards their estimate of the chances here. Mm -hmm. uh, Reardon's a little more pessimistic mm -hmm. that this guy is still alive, and she's holding out hope, which is a bit of a reversal for them because... It's not even holding out hope. She's like um, cockeyed optimist. She's yeah. like... Yeah. 
I think that's, as Robert okay. said, I think there's a kind of desperation for it to be true that makes her unable to... But Reardon, uh, Reardon's pessimistic, and he's the one who's always said, oh, all we have to do is just work a little harder, and, and this, this whole thing is going to pass. And so, I mean, in addition to the uh, kind of flaws about his psychology that we've been discussing, there's also this, he's, he doesn't have this optimism that she wants. Well, I think he's more realistic in this and, case. I mean, I think it's a more reasonable assumption that you, uh, there's some reason why this thing is abandoned here. Uh, what is she expecting? She's going to, like, go around a corner and find this guy sitting in a hovel in Star and Star and say, oh, okay, you want the motor now? I'll go and Well, maybe that, it. maybe that is a point that can help us transition to some of the big uh, picture stuff we wanted to talk about at the end, because yeah, if, it, if it's that. really true that this is not a very realistic thing that she's hoping to find, and it, the more realistic thing would be to go and try to fight these laws... Uh, that's what's going to kill her company pretty soon. Why is she? Why is she not trying to fight the laws? Why is she spending so much time instead going after the motor when the uh, the chances that it's actually going to help her so I think diminishing? we have to leave that question to see what happens to them over the, sure. the course of the next chapter. And given the time, I think we just want to um, transition to just talking about the next part of the book. Or sorry, talking about the part of the book as a whole, and we've got about and, twenty minutes left. And what we can say about that? So, For people who are online, I think uh, you should start to be thinking about uh, about what your what questions do you have about this about the, this mm -hmm. whole plot arc that we've seen in the first third of the book so far, and what thoughts do you have about it, and where have we come from, and where where do you think we're going? Though, so don't post spoilers if you're going to comment on that. I mean, if you haven't read this before, we're especially interested in seeing what you have to say. A few points of just knowledge going on in the chat now that I think are good. Laura is saying finding the inventor is giving her something to hope for in contrast to all the bad stuff going on around her. I think that's right and important. Um, and uh, Iris about, uh, and she made this point, I think last week or somebody did uh, here, that Reardon's perspective as an inventor himself gives him some more, you made it last week, gives him uh, maybe a different view on what it would mean for this guy to still be alive and his motors just, you know, rusting and being degraded somewhere. But yeah, so what is the, I, I want to ask three questions by way of kind of summing up the part. First, what is the story of part one? And I've given my take on it a few times. But what is the story of part one? I guess since I've already said what I think it is, I'll, I'll say it now. Can I say it since you already Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> the story is about the building of the John Gold Line and the results. And its consequences. Uh, yeah, the way I put it once is Dagny Tackert's greatest achievement and its consequences. So she builds the John Galt line and... How'd that work out? Yeah, and what are its consequences? Its consequences are, well, yeah, there's a quote on it, right? So, so read that, yeah, find that. I think that. you are thinking of the stuff on the last, second to last page, mm -hmm. uh, page 335. Uh, and she's thinking especially with the bondholders, this is what you had. The bondholders, she thought, of the John Galt line, it was to her honor that they had entrusted their money, the saving and achievement of years. It was on her ability that they had staked it. It was on her work that they had relied on their own. And she had been made to betray them into a looter's trap. There would be no trains and no lifeblood of freight. The John Galt line had been only a drain pipe that had permitted Jim Taggart to make a deal and to drain their wealth unearned into his pocket in exchange for letting others drain his railroad. There's that That's cannibalism. That's the idea of the looting and the right. cannibalism again. But also, I mean, it had not been what it was created to be. And it was, in fact, the opposite. Not a living plant fed by blood it had worked to produce, but a cannibal of the moment devouring the unborn cannibal children of Cannibal of the greatness. moment, so the mood, unborn children of greatness. So what's going on here? This line was cr worth creating and was created for a purpose, to serve the uh, industrial sector of Colorado, which is, re which is the renaissance of the country, and therefore make support and make possible a second renaissance of the country. What result did it have? Hastening the destruction of that. It's almost a really big kind of contradiction. Yeah. On this particular point, though, let me mention a, a story that I think is really worth reading, and I'll post a link to it. There's a Nathaniel Hawthorne story called 
the birthmark. Mm -hmm. And it's about an eminent proficient in all of the sciences who's really devoted to a certain ideal, the ideal of his wife and her beauty. And she's perfect except for this one birthmark. And he applies all his science and is able to eliminate the birthmark with the result that she's perfectly beautiful and dies because such perfect beauty can't exist in the world. And he achieves through his science, through his reasoning, his end. And then having achieved it, it therefore it's like cutting your nose to spite your face. It, it destroys the greater end for the sake of which that end is worth having. And that's what happens with the John Galt line. And why does that happen? What's the theme of other stories like the birthmark in which that happens? And why does that happen to Daphne's achievement? And that's something that Daphne's really going to have to struggle with. And I think we're going to see her struggling with it throughout the rest of the novel. Because she's the one who's been worried all along about whether these ideals are attainable, or whether it's just an unrequited love that she has for this and this, this is what we vision. see her thinking in this John Galt line office, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in general, you know, it seemed like her world would be in her reach, and then it wasn't. Uh, it seemed like she was getting there with Francisco, and then he goes all weird. It seems like she was getting there in her career, um, but then there's cotton to face, and you never get anywhere. And 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 then now she's in this office looking up the unattainable ideal of everything she loved. But the Hawthorne story comes to an end that way, and this is only the end of the first part. So there's there's more development yeah. to come. I think it's worth thinking about the, the, the view of life expressed by that story. And one lesson you might learn from the John Galt line story is that view of life. And if I think that that's a possibility to take from it is something that we to take from the story is something that has to be taken seriously. And that Dagny is thinking about is that right? Is that is that the kind of world it is. And I don't think she's the kind of person who thinks it's that kind of world, but that's a, a struggle that comes up. If it's not, if it's the kind of world in which working like Daphne and Reardon do, building something like the John Galt line should be successful, should be good, it shouldn't slip away from you and somehow undermine its reason, well, then it, why is it? What's the contradiction? If I, yeah, if I could, I alluded to that. And this is, of course, the title of the part, non-contradiction. Mm -hmm. And we get really some of the first, well, we had seen this language earlier in the, in the part where we heard rumors of a great philosopher who had given Two advice acts, yeah. about, about checking your premises when you find a contradiction. Well, it's Francisco who gives the advice earlier right. over the seeming contradiction of what became of him. And then when Daphne finds Hugh Axton at the end of her search for the motor, how did that go again? Well... Uh, yeah, no, but I mean, how did she get to you, Axton, just in a, a certain... She heard about him from Hastings' wife, who mm -hmm. had seen this guy at the diner hanging out with his her husband and his young idol. Right. So she, she finds out that the there, there was a young motor maker. Um, he knew this guy, and this guy worked at a diner. We don't know either of their names, but so she finds this diner, and she finds this guy. And lo and behold, it's this famous philosopher who retired. Uh, who was Francisco's teacher and a colleague of Robert Stadler. And he's working at a diner. He makes a good hamburger sandwich. He does make a good hamburger sandwich. Some philosophers are good cooks. Um, <laughs> Not this one, but <laughs> uh, that's a present hobby company of mine. accepted. Um, but, um, and Carrie Ann, too, that was weird. at a good meal at her place. Um, so, um, yeah, so what's the advice that he gives? Well, so th she finds out who he is and asks him, why are you working here? Because I'm a philosopher, she says, which is a paradoxical <laughs> answer. But this is all about paradox. The secret you are trying to solve involves something much greater than the invention of a motor run by atmospheric electricity. There is only one helpful suggestion I can give you. By the essence and nature of existence, contradictions cannot exist. If you find it inconceivable that, the, that an invention of genius should be abandoned among ruins. She, she, she hasn't uh, told him anything about having found yeah. this invention, by the way. And that a philosopher should wish to work as a cook in a diner. Check your premises. You will find that one of them is wrong. 
I got that right here. In my... Yeah. So what are the contradictions? A couple we can just mention that have come up in this scene. I think we can put together contradictions and mysteries, things that don't make sense. Um, one of them is that Francisco ends up as a playboy. Francisco had two friends in college, by the way. Recall when Dagny asked him if he liked college, he said, oh, I got two friends. Doesn't say anything more about them because they're not too one talkative of them a couple. Turns into a pirate. One of them we find out is Ragnar Daniskul, who turns into a pirate. Arr. The other one became a second assistant bookkeeper or something. Uh, we don't know much about him. Um, Stadler takes them as a sign that these were the most, the smartest people ever and whatever, and the fact that they, uh, nothing good became of them is a sign of the futility of reason. Dagny asks, asks him what he thinks of them, he who works in a diner, and Francisco says he is the practical application of Axton's teaching. Axton said he's proud, what is he, he's proud of them, prouder than he could have ever hoped to be, I think he even says. More proud than I had ever ever hoped to be. Yeah, more proud than I'd ever hoped to be. In so, spite of the fact that uh, about the third one, he says his name would mean nothing to you, he's not famous. Yeah. So there's a contradiction. What becomes of... What, or a mystery or something weird, doesn't make any sense. What's become of these people? Um, what's become of the motor itself. That what's it, become of the motor why itself? Why is this amazing invention abandoned in ruins? Why did the John Galt line end as it did? Why do the looters act as they do? Why does Lillian act as she does? Other mysteries? Why is Owen Lillian Why do they keep disappearing? Yeah. And we, we yeah. learned about some of the biggest Two disappearances, others, most this mysterious chapter. disappearances. Midas Three Mulligan. others in no. this chapter. Yeah. Midas Mulligan, Judge Narragansett, William Hastings, Ellis Wyatt, sort of Hugh Axton. So we see five people who pull out of what they used to do. What do we know about William Hastings? William Hastings is the chief engineer at the 20th Century Motor Company. Um, seemingly, the, Dagny briefly thinks he was the inventor of the motor, but it turns out, we learn from Hastings' widow, that this young assistant of his, who seemingly was a crony of Axton's, was the inventor of the motor. Um, uh, he died. Anything else odd about him? He stopped working at his profession. He retired. He was kind of old, but he didn't seem ready to retire. He goes yeah. away for a month every year. <clears throat> he goes away for a month every year. He acts like he's been tortured by something, but at a certain point, uh, he, has, he develops an odd serenity of spirit that she had never seen in him before in the last two years of his life when he's going away one month on vacation. Summer. He also has got some kind of laboratory in this basement where he's tinkering with stuff, and then none of it's there after his death. So this guy's and there's this young idol. There's this young uh, idol, th this motor maker, uh, who's friends with a philosopher Where turned he go? diner chef who's going to close his diner soon and doesn't know what he's going to do next, maybe open a garage or something. Um, anything yeah. else? Yeah. We know something about what happened <coughs> to Owen Kellogg after he dropped out of sight, mm -hmm. but that raises another mystery. Why is he working as a common laborer? Yeah. And there's other big disappearances. Um, I mean, all of the contractors that Dagny had wanted to, uh, or, that was recounting yeah. on at various stages of building the gold One thing line. that's interesting is Mulligan disappears, right? You mentioned, and there's a commonality between Mulligan and Hastings because there's this, uh, this Round weird at a character anecdote. I don't remember if the timings are the same, but there's this weird at a character anecdote on his last day where he's like, buys some flowers and talks about how he's always loved being alive and so forth, which sounds like of peace with the serenity that, that Hastings has. Any other mysteries we're forgetting in this whole part? Sure. Yeah. What was that? Halley's concerto. And Halley's disappearance and this. Mm -hmm. So the fifth concerto. Halley's another guy who retired, no one knows what's happened to him, but then we have the added weird thing that he wrote a concerto that he never wrote, or anyway, someone's whistling something that sounds just like him. I have one more mystery. Yeah. Um, Francisco's character. Mm -hmm. Francisco's character, how did he become a playboy? And, and what why exactly, is he so, yeah, but, why is he still somewhat, um, at least in his mannerism, remind her so much of uh, who he was? So in some ways he's very different, in other ways he, he seems not so different. So what, what's that shift that went on with him? 
he seems to have changed but not changed. And sometimes he changes in mid-conversation. <laughs> pardon, pardon my change of expression. Yeah. I'm so used to speaking with women this way. Yeah. Someone on the spoilers group was talking about all the ingenuity he puts into his playboy stunts uh -huh. for the Melting Palace. He says he can't be sleazy even when he's trying to. <laughs> And, and there's, the, there's the fact that uh, the, at least one of the women he's supposed to have been having an affair with turns out uh, to have been lying about the circumstances yeah, the of the affair. Of it, yeah, because she, she wasn't really with him uh, in his mansion because he was, he was at the opening of the San Sebastian lines at the time, and it was in the newspaper even. Any other mystery? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's a mystery to Hank, who the person that Dagny slept with. That's true. We're in, we're in the know of that. I'm going to go there. <laughs> that, but Hank isn't. And uh, he really he wants to know. And why is that the one? Yo, know, she implies that's the one thing I will never tell you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, it's an interesting question for us. We're probably in a position to answer why that's what she won't tell him. Why did she keep the affair a secret in the first place? She wouldn't tell him. Um, it's Francisco because he might just, it, it would probably stunt any improvement on his view of sex already because he'll just say, oh, I don't want to turn out like him. Or, or no, 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 but like, <laughs> well, I thought you were better than this, but it turns out, you know, you're just like one of the people he seduces all the time. You know, you're not, you know, better than those women he. Maybe. There's also. I think she's discreet and it's so holy and sacred to her. But she, it's like, you, she, it's just so private to her. It's holy and sacred to her, and that makes it private. And private in particular from what? What does she. She feels a kind of sense of, of sanctity that prevents her from wanting to expose their relationship to what? <clears throat> well, to other people's opinion of sex, which yeah. they think is evil, and she knows it's good. Yeah, so, she's. Yeah, she says to that, that kind of view she of sex. That. Exactly. She says that specifically. Yeah. And that's the view that Reardon, I mean, I don't know if Reardon had said to her the same things Francisco said the morning after, she still might have not, you know, might have kept it secret, but I'm not sure she would have. You know, she might have been. One last mystery. Yeah. Dollar sign cigarettes. Yeah. The dollar sign cigarettes. Any others? Any other you, further? Past or history. Uh, we don't really know exactly. We don't know that much about Nat Taggart's past or history? We don't know what he really did. But what did he, he did? Whether okay. he really killed someone or not. We didn't know whether he killed oh. someone person, so that's something we might look for as a solution. Yeah, it's pro very, perhaps those are all stories where people said, well, I don't know if it's true, but it's the sort of thing he would have done. Yeah. Remember that um, Simon Pritch, was it Pritchett, uh, was going around telling the story about how Reardon. Uh, didn't invent Reardon metal, he stole it from a penniless inventor who he then murdered. So these are the kind of stories that go around about people, yeah? Ragnar's a mystery because both of his teachers have totally different opinions of him. Yes, but he's another, he's like in this Francisco category, and why would this great student become a pirate? That's another guy who turns out weird. <laughs> Um, and I guess he's I, the other character who was never called just Dennis Gilmore. Yeah, that was the other one I was thinking. I didn't want to. I didn't say it earlier because that implies we're going to meet a lot more of him. But I think it's fair enough to suspect that we will. It occurs to me that Dan Konya and Dennis Gould are both a little hard to write typographically, so that's a reason to favor uh, Ragnar and Francisco. But I don't. Also, they're both cool-sounding foreign names. Also, what, what motivates Jim? What motivates uh, Jim? And, and Lily's and know Lily's, that matter. Yeah. Any other? What is Jim trying to get from Cheryl? What is Jim trying to get from Cheryl? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I feel like this is going to all end with a to be continued. And I have yeah. one more <laughs> question for us. Uh, well, there's who invented the motor. Yeah. There's who is this mysterious third student. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's who is John Galt? Who is the man at the end of the tracks? Who's the sh Oh, that's right. There's a shadow that that is stalking outside, um, outside uh, the window of the the John Galt line office. Maybe that's 
and maybe that's Reardon, but when she puts the motor in the basement, she hears footsteps she did, as well. Yes. And then so who, there's someone maybe following who, that. Who does Eddie talk to in the cafeteria? Oh, so Eddie's yeah. talking yeah. to someone who seems awfully interested in Tetrapay of the World. Well, although we never even hear him. We never hear him, yet we only get it from Eddie's perspective. He likes the name of John Paul yeah, that's right. But he doesn't seem like he's happy about it. Yeah, so this guy is this guy is a little weird. Um, there, there are any number of mysterious people and mysteries about people and their motives. And then there's the bigger question: what's happening to this world? Which is often what people mean when they say. Who, who is John, John Galt? I'm just seeing if there's anything, uh, seeing if there's anything, um, the mystery of the motor. I think we said that one, but if we didn't, um, uh, that's in there. Richard Halley, Halley I think we covered. Uh, will Reardon discover the concepts he needs, uh, Merrill asks. Um, Merrill, who wanted to make sure he pronounced her name right uh, in an earlier post, and I think we did. Um, um, did Halley write four or fifth con five concertos? What does John Galt truly mean? Um, we got another example of someone who quit, McNamara, the contractor. Um, <coughs> Conway also quit, right? I think we know a little bit more why he did. Um, Why did Francisco say the Atlantis story was true? <laughs> That's true, yeah. Francisco says about one of these ridiculous or far fetched seeming, I and mean, we don't know where this novel is going to go. Uh, the spinster she story. The spinster story. But she doesn't know she is. Yeah, sorry, you have your mic on, but yeah. She says she's telling the truth when she doesn't, she doesn't know it when this old spinster says uh, she knows who John Galt is. Uh, he's. Uh, he uh, discovered Atlantis, right? Um, so Francisco, uh, who's um, uh, uh, an odd and enigmatic character in himself, there's something odd and enigmatic about this John Galt story. We've heard several John Galt legends, which are maybe clues to who is John Galt, although that's weird because they, they're stories that don't seem like they could literally be true. They can't all be and true. And that the people can't be in a, I guess one guy could have found Atlantis and then the Fountain of Youth or something, but it's a great adventurer. Um, there, there are, yeah, there, several of them are Greek mythology illusions. I don't and so is the chap, so is the title of the book. And so is the title of the book, yeah. Atlas. Yeah. And then, uh, could you say a little something about the double meaning of the title of this chapter, why it's torch, because it's going to mean at least two things. Well, what two do you have in mind? Well, he torched the side of the mountain and said, mm -hmm. I left it as I found it. Uh, good luck. Mm -hmm. And then actually when you say that somebody's holding a torch or bearing a torch for somebody or something, uh, so what is, there's a flame. Mm -hmm. so, so I think it could be two things. So what is that, yeah. what is the, it's obvious mm -hmm. that he torched the landscape, but what could the, what could the, the torch also Interestingly, the torch? phrase why it's torch isn't in this chapter. Uh, I think we, it's not much of a spoiler to say that. Comes out later, next, the, very next chapter. Yeah, the, the fire which rages for some time, uh, we'll see how long, um, at his wells uh, comes to be referred to as why it's torch. So, in the sense of like, um, it's now a geographical feature uh, or a feature of the Colorado landscape. All right, well, we are at time. Mm -hmm. So, I'd like to thank everyone here and online, and we'll resume with. Part two, chapter one next week. Ben from Louisiana and me from here in New York with all of you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.